In this episode, let's take a look at some of the analysis tools in Adobe Audition. Here we'll be taking a look at several of the analysis tools within Adobe Audition, which will help you to clean up your audio or just sweeten it and make it sound better. First up, and the one that I probably use the most is the Amplitude Statistics Panel. This is critical to getting your video to the target loudness, and especially so you can get consistent loudness from video to video or film to film. On the general tab, the first one that I use most often is the True Peak Amplitude. This is a measure of the peaks of your waveform, and typically what you want here is to get those no higher than minus 1.5 dB true peak so that when you do your final export, nothing clips and distorts. Next up is average RMS. In the old school days, one of the things that they used often to measure overall loudness was average RMS. The problem with average RMS is it doesn't take into account silent portions of dialogue scenes, which are really important in some cases. And so it averages all that silence in as well, so you get kind of a skewed view of overall how loud the audio is. But I do find it useful, for example, if I'm trying to measure where my room tone is sitting, for example, or where the noise floor is sitting. So what I'll do is I'll just highlight that one section of room tone and or noise floor, and then the average RMS will show me about where that's sitting. Probably most importantly is ITUR BS 1770-3 loudness. That's a mouthful. <laughs> But really, you use this to hit your target perceived loudness. And in the case of going to web, you're typically going to be targeting minus 16 LUFS. That is the overall perceived loudness. It's often used for web distribution. And the reason for that is that a lot of times people are viewing these videos in very poor playback situations, like in cars, on mobile phones, in planes, in trains all these really, really noisy environments and on playback devices that aren't the most amazing because people are typically using earbuds or the phone speakers or things like that. Having that loudness in those cases is really critical. If you are distributing your video on TV, the targets are generally going to be minus 23 LUFS for European broadcast television or minus 24 LUFS for television in the United States and many parts of Asia. The thinking in this case and the reason why it's not quite so loud is that you retain a lot more of the dynamic range, but also people are generally listening and watching TV in their living rooms in better playback scenarios, so that usually works better. Next up is the RMS histogram. I often use this to see where the room tone is sitting, but instead of just getting a single number like average RMS, I'm now seeing the distribution of the least loud to the most loud part of the overall room tone. Next up is the spectral frequency display. This is really useful. You just drag up from the bottom of the screen and this is a way to visualize where the sound energy is across the audio spectrum. So where the low frequency material is, mid frequency, high frequency. This is usually how I determine whether it might be time for a high pass filter, for example. A high pass filter removes the lowest frequency energy. And the reason you want to use that in many cases is especially, for example, with a dialogue track, most people's voices don't extend below 100 hertz roughly. Some men's voices might go down to 80 hertz or so. But anything below that is generally just going to be rumble and noise and stuff that gets in the way of the overall mix. So using a high pass filter can clean it up quite nicely and very simply. It can also help to identify various types of noise to help you reduce that. For example, a hum will often show up here, a 60 hertz hum in places where the electricity lines run at 60 hertz or perhaps 50 hertz hums in places where the electrical lines run at 50 hertz. This will let you know if it's time to pull out that dehummer plugin. Also, broadband noise, that is noise that's scattered across the entire frequency spectrum, will often show up as purple or blue kind of haze across this view, and that's helpful for knowing if you need to pull out a broadband noise reduction plugin. This can also help you identify and clean up discontinuous noises. What I mean by that is, for example, if there's a line of dialogue and suddenly and unexpectedly a phone rings in the middle of the line of dialogue, you can actually identify that within the spectral frequency display here and you can use the paintbrush or the healing brush tools to actually clean that up. Next up is frequency analysis. This is a view that again shows you in real time the frequency of the sound as it's playing back. First of all, you can get a log or a linear view of the overall spectrum. Now, typically we're used to seeing the spectrum represented on a chart that is in log view. And what log view means is it gives more space to the low frequency sounds than it does to the higher frequency sounds. And that's just how we're used to seeing it. You can also switch it to linear so it gives the same amount of space to all of the different frequencies across the spectrum. 
What's nice about this is you can scan your entire piece and it can sort of sum up the overall energy across the spectrum of sound. Or you can also do snapshots as it's playing back. So if you want to capture what things look like at various times throughout the recording, you can do that as well. Now, why is this useful? It can be useful for many of the same things as a spectral frequency display. So for example, if you need a high pass filter, you'll see a lot of low frequency energy over here on the left. I find this one actually more useful for finding frequencies that are sticking out and that might need some EQ to kind of tame them or bring them back into the realm of where you want them. So for example, if you have a dialogue clip where it sounds kind of harsh and very mid-range focused, you can use this to identify which frequencies may be sticking out. Oftentimes, for example, you'll find something in the 900 to 950 hertz range that's kind of a spike. And if you do, you know you could probably use an EQ to pull that back and it will make the voice sound a lot more mellow and kind of smooth. Sometimes I also use this to find natural breaks between the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies if I'm going to, for example, be using a multiband compressor to compress my low frequency energy independent with a different threshold from my high frequency energy. One of the most common scenarios for where I may want to do that is that when I'm trying to manage sibilance in a dialogue recording. Sibilance is this kind of sizzling sound that comes out when someone says the letter S or C. If I can find a natural break between the low and the high frequencies, that gives me a kind of a natural breaking point to apply different thresholds to the low frequencies and the high frequencies. Now, what's really important is that there is also a simplified version of the frequency analysis in the parametric EQ plugin. So this is really helpful if you are going to need to be doing some sort of EQ. This will help you identify the exact frequency where you may want to do that. It doesn't have all the features, but it's really handy to have it in the EQ and just be able to drag your dot over to where you want to do a cut or a boost and drag it down and you're on your way. Two more analysis tools that I don't use nearly as often, but I should mention here as well. Number one is the phase analysis. This shows the phase relationship between two tracks of a mix. It can be helpful for finding problems like warbling or fluttering or thin sounding stuff. For example, in many production audio recordings for film, the actors have a lavalier microphone, plus there's also a boom microphone. So they're captured on both microphones at the same time. The reason that's typically done is to give the post mixer an option to choose which mic sounds the best. And if in some situations they forget to get rid of one of those mics, you may get some sort of phase interference and it will often sound kind of thin. And this plugin will help you to identify that. Next up is a spectral pitch display. This is probably more useful for mixers that are working on music as opposed to film, but it could be very useful for someone who's particularly creative. What this does is it shows which notes each sound is hitting. And again, this is mainly useful for vocal singing tracks where a mix engineer may want to decide whether or not they're going to use Auto-Tune or Melodyne or some other pitch correction plugin to help fix a particular recording. But if you're creative enough, I think you could use this in other things in the film world as well. If you wanted to do something kind of artistic where you take a dialogue line and somehow get it to fit and become the melody for a song, you could do that. Now, I'm interested to know if there are any of these particular analysis tools that you'd like to go more in depth on. I'm sure there are some of them that probably appeal to you more than others. Go ahead and leave those down in the comments below. Hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below as well. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon. Bye.